Thanks so much. Well, I feel like I'm in friendly territory here uh, in a building devoted to sustainability and a program a lecture series on sustainability. So uh, some of the things that I have to say over the next few minutes may already be uh, familiar to you, but I, I do hope to make one uh, claim that may, may be a, a new idea, uh, which is that global economic growth is in the process of coming to an end now. Um, it's not an entirely original observation or claim. Since this book came out, it actually came out in September uh, 2011. Uh, I've been meeting uh, economists, um, other authors and, uh, who, who are saying essentially the same thing. Uh, Paul Gilding, one of the, uh, who, who was the head of Greenpeace International for many years. Uh, Jeff Rubin, who, is, uh, who was the chief economist of CIBC until I think last year, actually before this book came out had already signed a contract with Random House for a book with the same title. <laughs> um, well, what are we talking about with economic growth? We're talking about increase in GDP, gross domestic product, which is a number that indicates how much money is being spent in the economy. And it's a marker essentially for consumption. What are people spending money for? Well, they're spending money so they can consume stuff. And uh, it's, it's uh, intuitively obvious that growth in consumption can't go on forever. Um, in fact, uh, the only thing that grows forever is the universe itself, assuming that, that the Big Bang happened 15 billion years ago and, and, uh, and no countervailing process is, is in store. Uh, think of it this way. Take a, uh, a hamster, newborn hamster, very tiny, tiny little organism that newborn hamster is going to grow very rapidly for the first uh, few weeks of its life. In fact, it's going to double its body weight every week. A very rapid rate of growth. Now, what would happen if our uh, proverbial hamster were to continue doubling its body weight every week for one whole year? 52 doublings. How big a hamster would we have? Guesses? Oh, uh, well, I'll tell you. It's, it would be a nine billion ton hamster at the end of one year. That's the magic of compound growth. Now, we've gotten used to the idea that economic growth is normal, inevitable, and it can go on forever. That's an absurdity because that implies ever-growing rates of consumption of resources on a finite planet. Okay, so that's you know, fairly uncontroversial statement. What is controversial is, I think, to claim that we are seeing the end of growth uh, now. And I'm going to explain why I think that's the case. First of all, a um, little background, why we have growth in the first place, it's largely because of energy. Without energy, nothing happens. And in most of our history as a species, we got energy indirectly from the sun, from from green plants, we exerted energy into the environment by way of muscle power, either human muscles or animal muscles. And then all of that changed with the fossil fueled industrial revolution where we found energy sources that were far more concentrated, were cheaper than anything we'd ever had before. One way of gauging that is um, if you've ever had the experience of running out of gas in your car, and I'm going to use American metrics here, excuse me, or US metrics. Uh, it, it maybe you had the necessity then of pushing your car, let's say 10 feet off to the side of the road. Imagine pushing your car instead of 10 feet, imagine pushing it 30 miles. How much effort would that take? Well, it would take six or eight weeks of hard human labor, assuming you could even move the thing, and I'm assuming you don't have a big SUV or something. So we get that done for us with a single gallon of gas that costs in California, where I live, less than $4. I think it's a bit more here. Think of that, six or eight weeks of hard human labor for, let's say, even 
you can't get labor that cheap anywhere. And that's why we have mechanized every process of production and transport we possibly could over the past 200 years. And that's given us enormous economic benefits. You know, look at the last 2,000 years, empires rising and falling and yet barely showing uh, a blip on this graph of GDP per capita. Well, while this was happening uh, over the last 200 years where we see all of that immense growth, uh, we were also increasing the number of capitas, the number of human beings since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution from 1 billion in 1800 to uh, just a little over 7 billion today. So multiply that per capita increase in wealth by the increase in population and you have some idea of the enormous amount of wealth that's been created as a result of having cheap fossil fuels. One of the things we did with fossil fuels was to use them to make stuff, manufacturing, uh, powered assembly lines, and that enabled us to make stuff in larger quantities and at faster rates than people could buy all of that stuff. The biggest economic problem of the early 20th century actually was overproduction. And many economists say that the Great Depression was at least partly a result of overproduction, market saturation. Well, we solved that problem with two strategies. One strategy was advertising talking people into wanting more stuff than they otherwise wanted. Uh, convincing them that they, they weren't happy, they weren't adequate, uh, unless they purchased more material goods. This, of course, is an ad for a 1910 Studebaker car. Uh, in 1910, uh, a, a new car like this cost about $900. Doesn't sound like much to pay for a new car today, but in 1910 dollars, that was a lot of money. This was a, a luxury item uh, that only the very wealthy could afford. But meanwhile, we had methods of making these things in such large quantities that theoretically everybody could have one. So how to, how to make that happen? Well, you talk people into wanting them and then you make it possible for them to go into debt to buy what they otherwise couldn't afford. Consumer credit was the other main strategy that we used to increase consumption by pushing consumption forward in time. Consume now, pay later. And it worked. Uh, after the Great Depression, after we had the problem of overproduction solved, uh, and especially after World War II, uh, consumption levels increase, debt increases, one other ingredient actually was required though, and that had to do with the, the monetary system and the financial system. See, up to this time, money had been tied to precious metals, gold and silver, but there was only so much gold and silver in the world. And so that put a, a certain limit on the, the velocity of commerce, on how, how much could be borrowed and spent so over the course of the 20th century, we reformed the financial industry, reformed the, the monetary system itself to de-link money from precious metals. So what is money then if it's not gold and silver? Well, money is debt and debt is money. It sounds kind of funny to say it that way, but th that's quite literally and exactly true. If you go into a bank and take out a loan for let's say $10,000, the banker doesn't go into the bank vault and search around somewhere for $10,000 that somebody else left there. No, the banker goes to the computer, makes a few keystroke entries, and creates $10,000 out of nothing as a deposit in your account. And then when you pay back that $10,000, it disappears. It's magic. Okay, so that makes it much easier for the money supply to go, grow in response to consumer demand. But when the banker makes that $10,000 loan, she or he is not at the same moment creating the money that will have to be paid in interest on that loan. So where does that money come from? Well, it comes from other people elsewhere in the economy also taking out loans. You're doing business with them, you're working for them or selling them stuff. And as long as the total amount of debt is increasing all the time, then theoretically everybody will be able to pay back their debts with interest. The problem comes 
if the entire economy stops growing, then there isn't enough new money being created to pay back the loans with interest and people start defaulting on their loans. Uh, banks pull back on lending, people start losing their jobs and the economy starts feeding on itself and collapsing. And that's essentially what happened. It happened in the Great Depression in the 1930s and it happened again in 2008. Now, <clears throat> up until the 1980s, uh, this was all ticking along fairly well. The real economy of goods and services measured by GDP was growing at a rather rapid rate. And the money supply was growing at approximately the same rate. Starting in, in the 1980s, debt grows faster than GDP. How so? Well, globalization starts in the 1980s. So uh, increasingly, people, let's say, high wage workers in North America are finding themselves in competition with lower wage workers elsewhere on the planet. So this, this puts downward pressure on wages, but people still want to consume more they're still being advertised at many hours every day. And we want them to consume more in order to grow the economy. 70% of the economy is consumer spending. So how to make that happen? By increasing debt, by making it easier for people to take on more debt. And that's what happens. Now, if, if you go to the bank and take out a loan, that's an obligation for you to repay. But if you're the banker making that loan, that same loan is an asset. So as debt grows as a percentage of the economy, then the financial industry begins to grow in relation to the rest of the economy. So it's growing faster than manufacturing, growing faster than farming and agriculture. The, the financial industry th therefore gains more power more political power within the society. This happened especially in my country, the US, where uh, uh, the financial industry began making large contributions to uh, political parties and, and individual politicians' campaigns. And as a result, the financial industry was able to get changes in the rules that regulate the financial industry so that it became possible for the financial industry to grow even faster. Now, if, if debt is growing faster than the real economy of GDP, the result is, a, is a, a credit bubble. These have happened before in history, but this is US total debt. As you can see, the lower blue area is household debt, and it's actually growing faster than government debt during this time. Everyone is so excited these days about unsustainable levels of government debt, but actually most of the increase was taking place in, in other sectors. Up until 2008, when with the financial crash, uh, total debt in, in the U.S. declined, except for one category, and that's the category at the top, that's government debt. What was happening? Well, the government was becoming the borrower and spender of last resort in order to keep the economy from imploding, the government had to borrow lots of money in order to keep the, the money supply uh, sufficient for, uh, for the economy to maintain itself. And then, and then <clears throat> real problems do ensue. We'll get back to, to that in a moment. Well, the idea that growth can't go on forever, again, is, is intuitively obvious, but it, it really uh, was argued with data and, uh, and analysis back in the early 1970s by a team of scientists at MIT uh, whose work was published in this book, Limits to Growth, which became the best-selling environmental book of all time. They used computers to model um, population growth, resource depletion, uh, uh, pollution from industrial processes. And, and this was a, basically a scenario exercise. It was not a, a, an attempt to forecast the future. It was a scenario modeling exercise. But most of the, of the models ended up showing a peak and decline in world industrial output sometime in the early part of the 21st century. 
The standard run scenario showed a peak and decline sometime in the first couple of decades, actually, of the 21st century. Now, of course, this, this report was widely maligned, uh, especially by mainstream economists who did not want to entertain even the possibility that there might be limits to growth, certainly not limits that we would encounter so soon. So to this day, many people who have heard of uh, limits to growth believe that it was discredited uh, years ago, when in fact, the, the standard run scenario is, is very close to real world um, outcomes over the past few decades in terms of, again, population, uh, resource abundance, and so on. So we seem to be right on track. Uh, one of those resources that's particularly important is oil. Remember, all of this happened, all of this rapid economic growth happened because we had sources of cheap, abundant energy. Oil was argu arguably the most important because it's highly portable and therefore a perfect transport fuel. So not, well over 95% of our transportation is, is oil fueled and trade depends upon transportation. So you can see the, the, the sort of linchpin status of oil in the global energy economy and, and the global economy per se. Well, the US was in a favored position in this regard because it was at the epicenter of the world oil industry. We're used to thinking of the US as the world's foremost oil importing nation, which it has been for, for many years. But in the early 20th century, the US was the world's foremost oil exporting nation by far. Over half the world's oil in, in some years was being produced in oil fields in uh, Ohio, Pennsylvania, Texas, Illinois, and, and so on. Uh, U.S. oil discoveries, the vertical green bars, peaked in the early 1930s. U.S. production peaked in 1970. This is the model of what happens to oil producing nations over time. And for the world as a whole as well, global oil discoveries have been declining since about 1964 and world oil production has been stuck in neutral since about 2005, even with very high oil prices. 12 years ago, oil was selling for, in, in, in inflation adjusted figures, a, around $30, and all the responsible agencies, that were, International Energy Agency and so on, were forecasting that today, in 2012, we'd be paying roughly $40 a barrel for oil. Instead, the international price is $115 a barrel. So that historically, this is a very high current price, and the laws of economics would suggest, therefore, that every producer would be eager to produce as much as they can to take advantage of these high prices, but it's not showing up in the market. Uh, and it's not a matter of a few oil companies sort of sitting on their production potential in order to keep prices up. Uh, there aren't just a few oil companies in the world, there are dozens, and they're all competing with each other for market share and for profitability. This is what the oil industry looked like a few decades ago. Uh, this is an example of what it looks like today, uh, where drilling in a mile or two or three of, of ocean water, an exploratory well can cost half a billion dollars and still come up dry. So as a result, the oil industry needs ever higher prices just to keep, uh, keep going. Of course the industry is profitable, but the drilling costs per unit of revenue are increasing pretty dramatically. And this is true for natural gas as well. Uh, we hear about the miracle of, of shale gas in, in the U.S., um, horizontal drilling and, and uh, hydrofracking of low porosity reservoirs. Yes, there is a kind of bubble of supply that's, uh, that, that we're seeing in the U.S. right now, but it's a result of heroic rates of drilling. And those, those wells have very rapid depletion profiles. So if, we're go if the U.S. is going to continue to see a large amount of natural gas coming to market, the companies are going to have to continue with heroic rates of drilling, and that's not happening. Actually, Chesapeake and Devon and some of the other 
companies that uh, specialize in hydrofracking are starting to pull back on drilling because it's becoming obvious that this is a kind of pyramid scheme. It's all being run on investment capital and almost none of it is being run on actual profitability of the wells drilled. So within the next two or three years, we're going to, be, we're, we're going to see a shakeout within that industry. And North America is going to go from glut to uh, something other than glut. I don't want to say famine with regard to natural gas, but we, we're, we're going to turn a corner. So if it costs so much to produce these inc increasingly lower grade energy sources, what does that have to do with the economy? Well, we've, we've learned from recent history that every time oil prices spike, the economy goes into a tailspin. Uh, the vertical gray bars are recessions, the squiggly line is oil prices, and as you can see, oil price spikes bite. Now that's not necessarily all that's happening, you know, uh, correlation is not causation. In 2008, we had the biggest oil price spike ever. We also had the worst uh, recession since uh, the Great Depression. Uh, but was it all caused by oil prices? No, there was also a housing bubble, especially in the US. But where and how did that bubble burst? Well, it started bursting in uh, f further suburban areas where people had to commute long distances to their jobs. So already their houses were inflated in price, so they were paying high mortgages, and then as the price of gasoline went up, people with big SUVs were finding they were spending over $100 to fill up the tank, and this didn't have enough money to, at the end of the month to pay the mortgage and keep driving back and forth to work. Something had to give, the credit card, so that's where the house prices started falling first, in those neighborhoods, and then spread like wildfire throughout the rest of the housing market. High oil prices also impact food prices because we spend so much oil making food. Fuel for tractors, uh, transporting inputs to the farm, tra transporting outputs from the farm, ultimately to the consumer's plate. So in 2008, with the oil price spike, we also saw a global food price spike. Same thing happened last year. And as food prices increase, social stability starts to suffer. I've outlined two reasons why I think world economic growth is coming to an end. They could be called depletion and debt. There's a third we could call disaster. Uh, impacts from burning fossil fuels in the form of climate change. Also, the increasing environmental cost of having to dig deeper to produce lower grade fossil fuels. And so we see accidents like this or uh, oil spills and uh, pollution of all kinds. These have real costs. In 2010, when the Deepwater Horizon disaster happened, uh, we also saw um, record droughts and floods. The total cost to insurance companies was something like $250 billion in 2010. Well, in 2011, last year, we passed the $250 billion mark as of June. So every year we're seeing records in the costs from natural disasters and industrial accidents. And the trajectory seems to be going in that same direction in the future. Meanwhile, what's happening with this European debt crisis we hear so much about? Well, it's being called a growth crisis. Why? Because nations took out lots of debt with the assumption that the economy would continue to grow and therefore they'd be able to pay back that debt fairly easily. Now that the economy isn't growing, that debt becomes unrepayable. So Greece is negotiating with its creditors a 70% uh, downgrade on it, uh, uh, write down on its, its debt. Who's next in line? Spain, Italy. It's, it's, it's fundamentally a trade-off. Either we have a sovereign debt crisis in which nations effectively go broke, 
or they renegotiate with the banks and then we have a banking crisis because the banks are insolvent because they're holding these toxic assets of uh, Greek bonds or sp Spanish government bonds or, or, or what have you. We've gotten hooked on economic growth to the point that if the economy stops growing, it doesn't just stabilize, it goes into a tailspin. What's the answer to all of this? Well, there's no solution, if by solution we mean getting back on the same old trajectory of uh, economic growth, population growth, and so on. We are, I believe, at a fundamental turning point in history. And by, by saying that, I don't mean this very moment right now and as of tomorrow, you know, the world will be bankrupt and riots in the streets and so on. What I'm saying is this decade is a, a fundamental turning point. We've already seen the beginning of it with the crash of 2008. And I don't think we'll see the end of it in our lifetimes. The rest of our lives are going to be spent under fundamentally different economic conditions from what we've been used to and what we've been taught to believe should be the way things turn out for us. So rather than solutions, I think we have to think about adaptive strategies. How do we adapt to these new economic conditions so as to minimize both human suffering and environmental damage? And, I, and that certainly can be done. I say build local resilience because, uh, first of all, our strategies need to emphasize local responses. If transportation fuels are going to become more scarce and expensive, that means that gl globalization will be running effectively in reverse. All of the financial incentives that made long distance trade um, economically efficient are going to start operating in the other direction, making local production for local consumption more economically efficient. Resilience is in some ways the opposite of economic efficiency. Uh, you know, if it's, if it's economically efficient to grow, grow all of your corn in Iowa, it's, corn grows really, really well in Iowa. It may be cheaper to grow uh, corn in Iowa than anywhere else. Well, in that case, we should grow all of our corn in Iowa, nothing in Iowa except corn. It's economically efficient, but it produces a br brittle system because if the corn crop in Iowa fails, then nobody has corn and Iowa has nothing. So by diversifying and also by creating redundancy within the system, we sacrifice some economic efficiency, but we gain resilience. So what is resilience? It's the ability to bounce back in the face of shocks. Shocks are on the way. Economic shocks, environmental shocks. So what we need is resi resilience organized at the local level. With regard to food systems, transport systems, financial systems, and more. As we do all of this, I think we're going to have to reform <coughs> economics itself because as a discipline, economics is, a, is a, a product, an intellectual product, if you will, of this anomalous fossil fueled period of the last 200 years. It's only been 200 years since the days of Adam Smith and David Ricardo. So the economists have looked out in the world and they've seen constant economic growth and they've concluded this, this is normal, natural, it can go on forever and that's what we should aim for. They've concluded that the entire environment is just a subset of the economy. It's a pile of resources that we extract, turn into products, and then that becomes waste. When in fact, the entire human economy is a subset of the ecosystem, of the global ecosystem, always has been, always will be. And if the ecosystem fails, there is no human economy. We have to understand that growth in population and consumption is fundamentally unsustainable. You can do it for a while, as we have done for the past couple of centuries, but you can't grow either population or consumption forever. And the limits are not just theoretical. They are very real and increasingly immediate. So we, have to, we should be planning for what size economy do we want, are we willing to live with, and what size economy can the Earth support? We should be thinking that way in terms of not only the global economy, but also 
what size cities should we be aiming for? How, just how big should Vancouver aim to be? Uh, is anybody asking that question? Uh, renewable resources have to be harvested at less than the rate of natural replenishment. Uh, it, it, it's a simple concept. A uh, 10-year-old can understand it. It's taken a couple of centuries for PhD economists to wrap their heads around it. But uh, we, we're obviously out of compliance with this simple principle because we're drawing down fossil reservoirs not, uh, of, of renewable resources as well as non-renewable resources like uh, uh, the, the, the water of the Ogallala Aquifer in, in uh, the western United States. We're cutting forests faster than they regenerate in many parts of the world. Ancient rainforests, uh, harvesting fish and so on. And then finally non-renewable resources where they can be recycled, of course we should recycle them. Where they can't be we just simply have to start using less. It's not only fossil fuels among the non-renewable resources that are becoming more scarce and expensive. Uh, up until about the year 2000, uh, a whole list of minerals and metals from antimony to zinc were actually getting cheaper every year. It sounds counterintuitive. Why would they be getting, getting cheaper if they're non-renewable and we're extracting them all the time? In principle, we were running out. Not, not in absolute terms, but we were drawing down the finite stocks. Why would they be getting cheap? Because we were applying more and more cheap energy to the process of digging deeper, refining lower grade ores, and globalizing the whole process of, of, of resource trade. So copper, antimony, zinc, you know, tantalum, all of them were, were becoming less expensive. And so economists looked at this and they said, well, there's the magic of the market. We'll never face resource scarcity because of the magic of the market. Well, guess what? Since about the year 2000, as oil has become more expensive, the cost of many, actually most of these mineral and metal raw materials has also risen. So here's a question. I just presented a, a few sort of commonsensical economic principles or rules. Can we follow those rules and still make one of these? I don't know the answer to that question, but I think it's a really interesting question, one that should be at, we should be asking because we seem to have collectively decided that these are the coolest things ever invented in human history. And if we really love them so much, well, how are they made now? through virtually slave labor on the other side of the planet, so a lot of transportation is involved, using rapidly depleting non-renewable resources. And then what do we do with them at, at the end of their useful lifetime? We chuck, chuck them into a landfill. Uh, that's a non-sustainable practice. And when, when we use that word unsustainable, I think we should, we should really viscerally understand we're, we're not saying that it's, that it's not eco-groovy we're saying it can't continue. So at what point does this model become impossible to pursue? At what point do we stop making um, you know, iPhones or, or what, what have you? I don't know. I, I mean, is it five years from now? Is it 10 years from now? Uh, my crystal ball isn't that clear, but surely it's not that far. It's not that long into the future. Can we make these out of locally available, renewable resources using you know, paying our, our workers decent salaries. It'd be interesting if somebody tried. As we make this fundamental economic shift, I think it is important that we look on the bright side. I've, be, I've been giving you some pretty gloomy uh, information, I know, but it's also true that we have paid a lot in human terms for economic growth. We have traded community for a sense of individualism that served the, the interests of the market, served the interests of economic growth. Uh, we've lost the sense of intergenerational solidarity. We, we've traded cooperation for competition and, and so on. There are lots of things that aren't at peak. And if we emphasize those and deliberately try to uh, to bring them back into our lives, it's very possible we could have actually happier lives even as we consume much less.
So we need to get rid of GDP altogether, which only measured, measures actually the, the, the economy that is, that is going away. And we need to start measuring what we want more of, whether we call it gross national happiness or uh, uh, some kind of genuine progress in, uh, indicator. All of these things have been, uh, have been researched and studied and, and are being used in various places. Uh, one useful uh, model that's being explored is, is the idea of transition towns. Making this transition away from from constant growth and the use of fossil fuels, reliance on fossil fuels, to what comes after, but doing it consciously, deliberately, and welcoming the process, saying, well, maybe life could be better without fossil fuels. What does that look like? Well, we'll only find out if we, if we get together as a community and uh, emphasize what is working. Uh, I've been promoting the idea of community economic laboratories, places set aside, hopefully at the center of town in towns and cities around the world, where alternative economic models can be brought together and mainstreamed. Uh, already, almost every community has some kind of alternative economic model going on, whether it's as simple as a, a credit union or uh, uh, car share program or something of that sort. But usually these are considered fringe and, uh, and sort of beside the point in terms of, of what, makes the, what makes the community go. Well, as the, the, the sort of mainstream engine of the, of the economy begins to sputter as the big banks find themselves uh, weighed down by their toxic assets, we're going to need all these, these alternative economic models to become the mainstream. And that's more likely to happen if people know of their existence so that if they want to volunteer their time, they'll, they'll know where to go. If they need help, they'll know where to go. I'm going to end by suggesting that this transition that w I've been describing is a big deal. As important as the harnessing of fire several million years ago that enabled us to cook our food and alter our environments in various ways, or language, which emerged several tens of thousands of years ago that enabled us to, to coordinate our behavior across space and time and had all kinds of ancillary effects, uh, you know, religion, mathematics, uh, literature, you know, on and on and on. The agricultural revolution of 10,000 years ago that enabled us to produce seasonal surpluses of grains so that we could have cities and full-time division of labor and civilization. And then the fossil fuel industrial revolution of 200 years ago. These were distinct, discrete, transitional points in human history that changed everything. I think the, the next one is going to be on that order. We could call it the sustainability revolution. Maybe, you know, maybe it's presumptuous of us at this point to put any kind of label on it. But it will be a moment when we learn to live within Earth's limits. When we grow up as a species, if, if you will. And that's, that's effectively the challenge that faces us for the remainder of our lifetimes, whether we're eight years old or 80 years old, uh, that these will be the conditions, these will be the challenges in which uh, that we will be facing and, and surmounting. So uh, thank you for your attention. I, I, I guess we have some, some time for questions and comments. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you.